This broadcast is brought to you by the British Israel Church of God. The Watchman Program. Evangelist and commentator Peter Salemi. Bringing you the truth about today's world news in the light of Bible prophecy. Hi, Peter Salemi, and welcome to the Watchman Program. You know, there's been much speculation about who are the two witnesses of Revelation, the 11th chapter. Many ministries and individuals have claimed that they are the two witnesses. Then there's been interpretations that the United States and the British are the two witnesses because they are end-time Israel. And we read in the prophecies of Isaiah of Jacob, my servant, being my witnesses. So they claim that the United States and Britain are the two witnesses. Others have claimed that it means the Old and the New Testaments. Well, exactly who are these two witnesses? Is it two countries? Is it two people, the Old and the New Testaments? How does the book of Revelation describe the two witnesses? Well, we're going to go through it from the Bible in this program. But before I get on with this subject, I want to offer you this free booklet, Who Are the Two Witnesses? Free of charge off our website, British Israel. Ca. You can download it directly from our website or we'll put the links underneath the YouTube player and you can download it directly from there as well. Take a look at this and I'll be right back. The mighty Roman Empire had everything. Plenty of leisure time. Their own new morality. Enormous military might. The religion of their choice. Political freedom. What went wrong? Read The Modern Romans, a 93-page lesson of history ignored. The Modern Romans asks, can we afford the grandeur of Rome? So who exactly are the two witnesses that we read of in Revelation, the 11th chapter? Are they two countries? Are they, is it the Old and the New Testaments? Or are they two individuals? Well, just looking at the scripture here in Revelation, the 11th chapter, verse 9, it talks about their dead bodies and how people won't put their dead bodies in graves. Verse 10 calls them two prophets. And after three and a half uh, days, in verse 11, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. So obviously, they are, they are two individuals, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Then in verse 12, it says, they heard a great voice from heaven saying, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Obviously, it's talking about the resurrection that you read of in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verses 16 through 17. So obviously, they are two individuals. Now, the Bible calls them two prophets. Now, does that necessarily mean that they are giving us new prophecies, predicting future events? Well, when you look at the Bible, you will find that the age of the prophets is over. Isaiah, the eighth chapter, shows us that after the disciples of Jesus, there is no more Bible. The Bible is now sealed. And we have all the prophecies we need in the Bible. So if they are giving us future events, the two witnesses, they are probably giving us the prophecies that we already have in the Bible about the coming kingdom of God. Now, when you look at the word prophet, in the New Testament, in the Greek, when you look at the Strong's 4395 and 4396, you will find that it means one who is under divine inspiration, an inspired speaker. Now, when you look at the ministry of the two witnesses, they rain down judgments from Almighty God. And then in verse 7, it says, And when they have finished their testimony, they are giving a testimony, they are testifying to the world the truth of Almighty God. And when you look at Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 18, the Great Commission, you will find that the apostles did the same thing, and God gave them the power to do so. Matthew 10, 18, it says this, And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, 
for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Verse 19, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speaks, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So these people are under divine inspiration. The bulk of their ministry is testifying to the world the truth of Almighty God, and they're under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So they are really inspired speakers and not a prophet, one who is foretelling future events, giving us new prophecies. If they are giving us any prophecies, they are talking about the prophecies that are already in the Bible. And we go through this in this, in this booklet, Who Are the Two Witnesses? Free of charge, off our website, BritishIsrael.ca. Take a look at this, and I'll be right back. I said, well, hmm, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Download your free booklet, Is There Really a Hell Fire? at BritishIsrael.ca or call or text for a free hard copy at 905 447 4415 or 416-898-7407. All right, let's continue on with this prophecy in the book of Revelation, the 11th chapter. Let's start in verse 3 where it says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy, meaning inspired speaking, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, a thousand, two hundred, and three score days. That's a three and a half year period called the Great Tribulation clothed in sackcloth, which is always a symbol in the Bible of mourning and repentance. It says in verse 4, these are two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Zechariah the fourth chapter verses 11 through 14 shows that these are two anointed ones, obviously two individuals that are giving out to the world God's message. Verse 5, it says, If any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth, and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. That's reminiscent of uh, what happened in Elijah's day, where when Elijah's uh, enemies came to get him, uh, fire came down from heaven, heaven and devoured his enemies. Notice verse 6, These have the power to shut up heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, just like in the time of Elijah, where he shut up heaven for three and a half years. And you can read that in James, the fifth chapter, verse 17. Now, a lot of people speculate, who is the Elijah to come? Well, here it is. The Elijah to come, Jesus Christ prophesied in uh, Matthew, the 17th chapter, verse uh, 11, it says, Jesus said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. Jesus prophesied that Elijah would come, and if you notice where it says to restore all things, this means, hence, it means, from Bart's, Barnes notes, to heal, to correct, to put in proper order. Here it means that Elijah would put things in a proper state. He would be the instrument of reforming the people or of restoring them in some measure to, to proper notions about the Messiah and preparing them for his coming. In other words, repentance and that's what their ministry is that's why they are clothed in sackcloth they are telling people to repent because Jesus Christ is coming and the kingdom of God is about to appear so the coming Elijah that Jesus prophesied is one of the two witnesses that we read of in Revelation the 11th chapter now look at the latter end of that verse in verse 6 it says and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues and as often as they will. Just like back in the days of Moses, Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh and Janus and Jambres, who were a type of the beast and the false prophet, and they said, let my people go. 
and of course rain down plagues and uh, water turned to blood and so on the we all we all know about the plagues of egypt and the this is exactly what's happening here in the days of the two witnesses. Now notice verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, shall overcome them, and shall kill them. Notice verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, a lot of people take this to mean that this is going to happen in Jerusalem. The two witnesses are going to be in Jerusalem, but look at the context of the verse. Notice it says, the great city. Now, when you look at the book of Revelation, eight times elsewhere in the book of Revelation, this is from Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary, commentary, eight times elsewhere in the book of Revelation, it is used of Babylon. And we all know, when you look at the prophecies of uh, the book of Revelation, Babylon is that great city, the city of Rome. And now it says here, our Lord was crucified, but Jesus wasn't crucified in Jerusalem. The Bible plainly says that he was crucified outside of Jerusalem. So what does this mean, where it says, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified? Well, look at the context. It says, spiritually called Sodom and, and Egypt, where also, spiritually, our Lord was crucified. Now, how was our Lord crucified in a spiritual sense? In a spiritual sense. In Hebrews, the sixth chapter, the Apostle Paul talks about a falling away. And what happens to the individual or even the church that falls away and goes back into the world? This is how he puts it. Hebrews 6, 6, it says, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. They, put, they crucify Jesus Christ spiritually in their life. Now notice how the Apostle Paul puts it in Galatians 2.20 about the converted Christian. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The converted Christian has Christ living in them. And when we go apostate and we go back into the world, well, then we put to death Christ in our life. As he puts it here, they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. Now, in history, we see a church laying aside everything that the apostles uh, established in the church of God, of keeping the commandments of God, of keeping the seventh day Sabbath, of keeping the festivals of Almighty God, of the Passover, the days of unleavened bread, uh, unleavened bread and so on. The, there's a church in history that laid aside all of that and they established their own righteousness, their own commandments of taking up Sunday and Christmas and Easter and try to enforce it on the rest of Christendom. And there's only one church that did that in history and that is the church in Rome, which is a church but is also a city, the great city, the city of Rome. The Vatican City, and the, actually the whole city of Rome, is the city of the Pope, which is a church and a city, and the Bible calls that the city, that great city, Babylon. So when we go back here and it says in verse 8, that their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, the city Babylon, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also spiritually our lord was crucified that happened in the city of rome in the church of rome so the two witnesses are not going to be prophesying in jerusalem they're going to be prophesying in the city of rome and then it says that all the peoples and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies after the beast the beast kills them three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Kind of sounds like Christmas. Is it going to take place at Christmas time? Well, we're going to have to wait and see. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And then in verse 11, it says, After three and a half days, uh, the spirit of life from God entered them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. So obviously, these are two individuals that have a huge responsibility on their hands. I mean, raining down God's judgments on a sin-sick world is a huge task, a huge responsibility. 
And of course, one of them is the coming Elijah. It is not Herbert W. Armstrong or anybody else. One of the two witnesses is the coming Elijah prophesied by Jesus Christ. Who these individuals are, I don't know. We're just going to have to wait and see. And as it says in verse 9, the whole world is going to see them. So we're just going to have to wait. This can only apply to our modern world in which we live with TV and internet and radio and so on. And we're just going to have to wait and see, see on our television screens if we're not in Rome, see on our TV, TV screens, internet, who exactly these people are. When they start raining down God's judgments, we will know for sure who these two individuals are. Get this free booklet, Who Are the Two Witnesses of Revelation, the 11th chapter, free of charge, off our website, BritishIsrael.ca. This is Peter Salemi saying goodbye, friends, and I'll see you here next time on the Watchman Program.